Um, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, just a quick little uh, reminder, if you're new, um, or if you have any prayer requests, please fill out uh, the cards that are available at the back there. We'd love to stay in touch with you and be praying with you um, about whatever it is that you desire prayer for. We uh, serve a God who hears and answers and responds to prayer, so praise the Lord for that. Um, and also, uh, just a quick little update, uh, we met with the um, architect on Friday, and uh, the plans, uh, we finalized everything for that, so hopefully she's going to have everything updated within the next week or so and start going out to start getting bids um, for the building project. Um, they gave us an estimated time of uh, three weeks-ish before the first round of, of uh, responses come back for the civil drawings, which need to be finalized before we submit for the building permits. But legitimately, we could be looking at towards the, the end of September, early October front time frame to start moving some dirt around. So just be praying for that, um, you know, and God can move. Yeah, praise God. Um, so uh, just be, keep that in prayer uh, through the whole process. Um, Christina and I this morning, uh, we just get so excited about the possibilities with things and, and all of that. So just be praying. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you. Um, we're hoping maybe even for like Christmas time to be able to put up a nice big tent on the property, uh, to have the parking lot done and everything so that we can celebrate Christmas there on the property and that kind of stuff. So anyway, just be praying for all of that. We're just like thinking all the possibilities God could have to reach out to the community even already then. So um, also a reminder, Bible studies throughout the week, men's and women's Tuesday nights here, uh, 7 o'clock. So please come uh, and be a part of that Thursday night home fellowship, Saturday morning men's Bible study for more information, please please talk to us afterwards and we'll get you more information on that. So, awesome. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we've come as far as verse 26. 1 Corinthians 1, beginning in verse 26, Paul writes, For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, and the despised God has chosen the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. Verse 30, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. We talked last week about uh, the verses preceding this, about how we were comparing wisdom and foolishness, and, and even interchanging that Paul did, the, the wisdom of God is foolishness to the world, right? And then, the, the, but the, the world looks at it as the foolishness of God, and all of the, we talked about those things back and forth, and really it comes right down to it, and we see that if you fully embrace one side, you're going to think the other side is foolish. Right? I mean, if we're going to, as Christians, we embrace the fact that God created everything with a word. There was nothing except a triune God. There wasn't time, space, matter, anything. And in a moment, by his word, here is creation. He, he spoke it all into existence. We believe Genesis chapter 1. And we believe that Genesis chapter 1 took place roughly 6,000 years ago. Now, the world says, well, that's foolish. That's crazy. And they come up with this idea of evolution, that billions of years ago, yes, there was nothing, but all of a sudden, in a moment, bang, everything is here, and over billions of years, here we are. Now, we think that's foolishness. They think what we say is foolishness. The flood, we believe, as Genesis tells us, in a worldwide catastrophic flood that has destroyed every living thing except what was God produced in the ark, Noah, his family, and two of every animal. And we believe that it's because of that that we look around and we see things like the Grand Canyon and all of this stuff that is around the world. We can explain it with this worldwide flood and it makes perfect sense to us, but the world says, well, that's foolish. It happened over billions of years of erosion. And we say, well, that's foolish. And we think, you know, this back and forth idea, right? We believe in the providential hand of God in our lives, that nothing happens by chance. Yet, the world embraces and says, well, that's foolish. Everything happens by luck. <laughs> Everything happens by random chance. 
We believe, as the Bible tells us, that there is a literal heaven and a literal hell. One of those two places is where every living human being who has ever lived, ever will live, will spend eternity. And the world says, well, that's foolishness. If you, when, you, when you stop breathing, you just cease to exist. Those that do embrace the possibility of a, of a heaven and, and all of that said, well, some of them say, well, all roads lead to heaven. Eventually, every one of us is going to get there. You just got to believe and everything. But we know that the truth of God's word, because God said it himself, God in human flesh said that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the only way to heaven. Then we come to the whole idea of grace versus works. And again, depending on what side you stand on, the other side is, is foolishness. And can I say that there's a third category that's even more foolish? And that's when you try to put the two together. And say, let's we can we can all we can agree. <laughs> we can agree in creation and evolution. We can put it together. We can agree with these different types of things. And guys, that's one of the things that as the church we've become most foolish in, and the church as a whole, to say, well, let's just Let's concede on some of these points. We can't. It's the truth of God's word. It's not up to us to concede or to, or to soften or to say anything about that. Well, we see here that, that Paul is tying this directly to this as he's tying it together. And we need to understand that it wasn't always like this. Right In the beginning, there wasn't any conflict with this. In the garden before the fall... There was, there was a perfect thing. There was, everything was illuminated. Adam and Eve saw everything. They understood the truth. It was all right there. But Satan enters the picture, bringing temptation. Adam and Eve fall into sin. This whole desire to be like God. I get to do my own thing. And what happens there is darkness comes into the picture. Blindness to spiritual things. We've heard the term in the dark, right? Somebody keeps you in the dark about something. What does that mean? Well, it means they're keeping you ignorant. They're keeping you from the truth. They're holding back the truth from you. We, we, we use the term, well, you're blind to the truth. You can't see it. Well, guys, understand, we were all in that place. But Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 9, But you, as born-again believers... You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who, notice, has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We were all walking around in this state of darkness, spiritually blind, but he called us out of that place into his marvelous light. He goes, for once you were not a people, but now you are a pe the people of God. You have had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We sang that song, the lyrics in that, but God. I love that. And throughout the Bible, but God, the mercy of God. Not because we earned it, not because we did anything to obtain it, but God, in his mercy, calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Again, tying this directly together, the first word in verse 26 is for... So verse 25 says, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men, for, why, what, what, what makes sense of that statement? Well, we see it here, for, consider your calling, brethren, there it is, that word again, calling, called, we've talked of this over and over, this is the supernatural, sovereign call of God on a blind, dead human being to come into the free gift of salvation that he has purchased for us. This is the divine side of salvation. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, blind to the truth of God's word, and God takes the initiative to reach out to us, to call us. Notice in verse 30, we'll get there in a little bit here, but it says, but by his doing, he does it. It's his action towards us. It's the, the first part in the redemption process being applied to us as individuals. Jesus hung on the cross and he said, it is finished, paid in full. But that has to be applied to each individual account. It has to be applied to yours and to mine. Romans chapter 8, <coughs> beginning in verse 28, it says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to love God and are called according to his purposes. Again, he is the one who is calling us for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. That's the end. 
That is, that is the end for all of us, to be fully conformed to the image of his son. And again, we're going to circle back around to that as we complete our, our study today. So that he would be the firstborn of many brethren, and these whom he predestined, he also called. It, we see it over and over in the scripture, his calling us. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. Part of the eternal plan of salvation that God, the triune Godhead, put together before the foundation of the world, before time, before space, before matter, before Genesis 1-1, part of the eternal plan of salvation was to call you personally. Now, I know we can't wrap our minds around the full reality of that truth, but it's the truth. The Bible speaks very clearly of that fact that before the foundation of the world, he chose to place his love on you personally. We are part of the family of God by his personal loving choice of us. Not because of who or what we are. Anybody else thankful for that? That he didn't that he wasn't sitting back there and says, you know, I gotta we gotta pick our top 100 guys or whatever it is. No, it's in spite of me. In spite of who I am, in spite of what I've done, he chose me. And Paul uses this word, consider. For consider your calling, brethren. And just to remind you, Paul is writing to the church in Corinth, the people alive at the time in the church in Corinth about this, but as we've said, the Holy Spirit preserved this because God is writing this letter to us. So consider, think about it. Think about your calling. Think about what it is. Just look at yourself. <laughs> and I, may, may I say this? Look at yourself before we look at those around us. Because that's always the right. We want to say, yeah. Right? No, look at yourself. It's not meant to be a put down what Paul is saying here. It's to highlight the love and the power of God. It's also to destroy our pride, because as we'll talk about as we continue to go through this, we, we always want to have this thing that we can say, yeah, but, but I added to it, or yeah, but I did it, or God really knew what he was doing when he picked me, you know, uh, all I needed was that little push, and just look at me go. He says, consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble, first of all, notice it says not many doesn't say not any. I read a, a, a couple of times this week in different accounts that there was once a, an aristocratic, very well-to-do, um, uh, wealthy woman of very much power and prestige that became born again. And her testimony was, I was saved by the letter M. <laughs> because it says, not many, but not any, because he saved me. And he chose to, to place his love and grace on me. But it says not many. Now, notice it says not many according to the flesh. According to what the world just judges by. All of those types of things. But can I tell you that if it said, if it said according to God, it would be not any. Because there is not any that is wise according to God. <laughs> we put people, we elevate people and we look at them as wise according to our standards. But according to God's standards... There's nobody wise. There's nobody mighty. There's not one person that can take on God. There's nobody noble when it, we're comparing it to the holiness of God. But God chooses, as it tells us here, those things according to the flesh, the wise according to the flesh, those that are, that are proud of their academic achievements, that have all sorts of letters behind their name, and we, we just bow down to that as, as human beings. We look at that and we say, man, you are so smart because of all the school you've done. And whatever you say, we'll just do it. If you doubt that, look back a couple of years, right? <laughs> We're asking all these quote-unquote experts on something that nobody's ever experienced before, and we just did whatever they said. Yeah. Because we, we elevate that, the, the wisdom of man. But it tells us here that, that God doesn't, Look at those credentials when he calls. Not many mighty. You're talking about, you know, political, military 
controlling power, those that are dynamic, those that are that are that are that are powerful, those that are that are that are super popular, if you would, that achieve their positions independently of God. That we we know the Bible tells us that God, no one is in a place of authority or power without God acknowledging that, without God placing them in that place. But they, on their own, according to the world, have gotten their independent. They're not looking to God. They're not following God. As a matter of fact, their kind of whole thing is, I will do whatever it takes for me to get to the top. Lie, cheat, steal. And it's amazing how we, again, as a culture, as we as, as around, we look at that and we say, man, they really manipulated the system. And there's, there's almost like honor in that. That we would look to that and we, we, knowing all of the facts about people, we still vote for them. We still put them in these places of power because it's almost like we respect that as a people. How sad is that? Not many that are in that position, God calls. Not many noble. <coughs> Speaking here of affluency, high social standings, wealth. Most in that position feel very privileged because of all of that and look down on the, the rest of society. And again, notice it says not many. And we see, and we, we see an example of that in, in, in the gospel accounts of the rich young ruler. Right? And we could plug that all in there. We could say the rich young ruler, the rich, rich wise ruler, the, the, the young mighty ruler. You know, we could plug all of those things in there. And Jesus, he comes to Jesus, he says, what do I need to do to be, to be saved? And he says, well, obey all of the commandments. And in his pride, he says, oh, I've been doing that since I was a kid. No problem. Jesus said, this one thing you lack, sell everything that you have, give the proceeds to the poor, and come follow me. And it tells us that he went away sad because he wasn't willing to do that, because that is what defined him, his wealth, his power. <coughs> he wasn't willing to put that down to follow Jesus. And Jesus goes on to say that, again, that it's more difficult for the camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for the rich man to enter into heaven. And his disciples were like, whoa, what does that mean? And bottom line, he says, "With man, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Before we move on from that, we here in our in our culture, we don't have that that nobility, right? We don't have kings and queens here. We don't have that type of stuff. But I'm challenged when I think about that. To, who are the no, nobility in America? And I look at that and I think, you know, well, all of the superstars, all of the athletes, the superstar athletes, the Hollywood elites, the the recording stars. Isn't it amazing that people want to know what they think about stuff? I mean, what, what's your opinion on this? Or, you know, when they come out in a, with a certain stance on some political issue or some social issue, it, it, it's elevated and they get millions and millions of views on their or likes on their, their Twitter pages and all this kind of stuff because it's like, oh my gosh, so-and-so said this. I'm like, so what? <laughs> what, what does that have to do with anything? But we elevate that. And can I tell you that it, it, can, it can get into the church? Because I don't know if you've heard this before. Maybe you've even thought this before. But it, 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 wouldn't it be awesome if so-and-so got saved? And what God could do with so-and-so if they got saved? I mean, man, wouldn't it be, what if LeBron James got saved? Wouldn't that be so awesome in how many people he could reach? What if, yeah, can I tell you? It would be awesome if LeBron James got saved he'd go to heaven. But his testimony would be no better than yours. His testimony carries no more weight than yours does. It might get out to more people because of his Twitter followers, but can I tell you, the moment he does that, his Twitter followers are going to start dropping like, like a rock. We, we have a tendency, even in ourselves, to elevate those things that God says you know what, if, if the secret to getting the gospel around the world was to save LeBron James, mm -hmm. he'd be saved now. God doesn't choose that. God chooses to use you and me. We see in, in verse 27, God's plan continues as, he, as it lays it out here. He's chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. The base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. The things that are not 
so that he might nullify the things that are. God chooses who he chooses, why he chooses. It's not based on what, the, again, the world values or elevates. The things that are foolish, notice again, according to the world. Not, not foolish things, but according to the world, to shame the wise. And we talked about science earlier, you know, the whole idea of evolution and, and science rejecting God, you know, for the most part. There are Christian, there are scientists that are Christians. There are, absolutely. And, and praise God for their work and the fact that they're standing up and, and, and proclaiming the truth about this because it, it is truth. It is there. But most of science rejects God. And they say that it's foolish to draw the conclusion that God has. And the best that science can hope for is to come closer to understanding how things are the way they are. But they will never be able to find out why things are the way they are. Ever. Because they're looking the wrong direction. They're looking in all of the wrong places for the why. And can I tell you, once you find out the why, the how is the easy part. But God. God, God created all things, the Bible tells us, for his glory, for his purposes. He's created you and I to worship him, to, to seek him out, to, to know him, and to enjoy him, to glorify him. Understanding that he is sovereign, that his providential hand is involved in everything. That's the why. Foolish things according to the world to, to shame the wise. The weak things to shame the strong. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus tells us as his followers, we want to follow him, we want to honor him, we want to live a life that honors and pleases God. If somebody strikes you on the right cheek, what are we supposed to do? Turn the left cheek. If somebody sues us, and takes our shirt, or takes a shirt right off our back. What are we supposed to do? Yeah. Counter sue <laughs> for damages and all that. No, Jesus said, "Give him the, give him your coat too." If you're, if you're forced to carry one mile, and to understand in those days, if a Roman soldier tapped you on the shoulder and said, "Carry my stuff," you were obligated by law to carry it one mile, not one step further, but you had to carry it a mile. You had to drop what you were doing and carry his stuff for a mile. That was the law. Jesus said, don't stop at one mile, do it two miles. <clears throat> and the world looks at that and says, how weak? How weak? To turn the other cheek? No, man, if I get, if, if somebody hits me, man, there's, the second hit is going to be them hit the floor. Right? <laughs> that, that's, that's power. That's strength. Nobody, nobody messes with me. But Jesus says, turn the other cheek, to, to give, to do all of those. And God chooses the weak to shame the strong. Understand when that shame takes place, too. It doesn't happen when we do that, necessarily. One day it will, though. One day when they stand before, before God, those foolish things that we stood up for, those weak things, according to the world, when all of that will be on display and they are humbled before Almighty God, when it says every knee will bow and every tongue confess. <clears throat> the base and despised, the things that are not to nullify the things that are. The things that are not to nullify the things that are. And again, speaking these contrasting things to the world and the, what they embrace the things that are not are spiritual realities, right? To them, it's all natural. There's, there's not this spiritual element, but to those of us, as we talked about earlier, we have this vision. We can see. We, our spiritual eyes have been opened. We're not blind. We're not in the dark. They are. So when we describe things to them from that perspective, we have to understand to them it's going to be foolish. To them, there are going to be things that are not. They're going to be non-entities to them. And the reality is, you know, if we think of somebody who is born blind, has never seen, they're born blind, they have no idea what a rainbow looks like. I, they, they, every once in a while, there's a sunrise or a sunset here in Houston that kind of goes, wow, that's beautiful. 
But can I tell you, being from Phoenix, Arizona, it is several times a week you, have, you can see a sunrise and a sunset that takes your breath away. And the reason why is kind of sad, because there's so much dirt and dust in the air and pollution and all of that, that the sun rays come through it. It's just, but I tell you what, there are colors that are, that are beyond description. They're just so beautiful. It's like the, 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 the sky is on fire. Well, a blind person knows what fire feels like, but they have no idea what it looks like. And so we need to understand that those things that are not to the world, they're very much a reality. And we can't expect that when we look at these things that, according to the world, of the world, of the world, of the world here, and understand that the same was true with us, again, before... But then we come to verse 30, and it does tell us, verse 29, we'll tie this together with verse 31, so that no man may boast before God. There's nothing, there's, God chooses all of these things so that none of us can stand up and say, well, of course he chose me, right? Because there's nothing in me. God chose all of these. But notice verse 30, but by his doing, by his doing, he did it. You are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. He became those things to us. This is so important, guys. This verse 30, notice it says, By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. He is the one who transferred us from darkness into the kingdom of, of light. He is the one who has done that. We have all that we have, all that we are, all that we need from Him. Though we might have very little of what the world values, what the world thinks is important, if we have Jesus and we learn to lean on Him and to trust Him in His power moment by moment, guys, we have the secret to life. Abundant life, as Jesus called it. He, he came to give us life and life in abundance. And notice, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us. Became to us. We're going to see this through as we look at each one of these things. He becomes these things to us. He doesn't provide them to us. He, he is those things to us. First of all, wisdom from God. He's become wisdom from God. Now, most of us, can grab a hold of that theoretically, but how many of us grab a hold of that practically and in reality, moment by moment, all the time, that the wisdom of God is available to us because Christ is in us. Because when the moment comes to act in godly wisdom, how many times do we grab a hold of our, well, this is, this is how I should react, or this is, this is you know, my own way of responding. One of the primary purposes of Scripture is to teach us to walk in a different way. To show us how to live by a different power in everything that we do. Not just every once in a while. From the simplest task to the most difficult. Do you realize that God has a very specific personal will for you? And I, I'm not just talking like big painted brush stuff. Like, yeah, I know, his, his desire, his will for me is to go to heaven. Yes, that's true, and the Bible tells us that. It's God's will for us, our justification. It's God's will for us, our sanctification. It's God's will for all that we be spirit-filled, very much so. But God has a very specific, personal, daily will for you, too. And I realize I don't, I don't want to get it too granular, but I don't know that I can. Because he wants to be involved in every decision that you make. Because, do you realize every decision that you make, sometimes people might say, well, flip a coin, it really doesn't matter. It does. Now, we might choose the wrong path, quote unquote, and we can fall back on, praise God, Romans 8, 28, that even if we do, God works all things together for good, for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. But if we would just stop, if we would just slow down and follow as the wisdom of God guides and leads us, can avoid a whole lot more of those ones that that that, that trip us up, that, that get us that get us stuck. Turn with me to the book of Colossians. We're in 1 Corinthians. Go to the right. 
get to Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, then Colossians. Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Notice Paul writing here, For I want you to know how great a struggle I have on your behalf, and for those who are in Laodicea, and for all those who have not personally seen my face. Guess who that includes? You and me, right? I, didn't, I haven't seen Paul face to face, so I'm going to throw myself in that category. That our hearts, their hearts, may be enlightened, having been knit together in love, and attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, and here's the mystery, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of infinite wisdom and knowledge are in Christ Jesus. And where is he? In us. We're paying attention. <laughs> Back to verse, but in, by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus. We are in him and he is in us. All of that. This wisdom, guys, is ours right now. Because... He's in us right now. And he became to us wisdom. His wisdom imparted to us. The infinite resources of true wisdom are ours in him. Notice secondly, back in our verse, verse 30 here, by his doing who became to us, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, notice, and righteousness, and righteousness, the righteousness of God. And not righteousness the way the world looks at it. No, the righteousness of God, his standard, which is the only one that matters. All that God is, all that he commands, all that he demands, all that he approves of, and by the way, all that he provides, are ours, again, in Christ Jesus. In Christ. He became to us righteousness. He didn't just demonstrate righteousness and say, okay, now you do it. Praise God, right? Be like, okay, here, I live this perfect life that pleases and honors God, that gets to heaven, and then he looks at us and he goes, well, it stinks to be you because you didn't do it. <laughs> no, he, it's, it's, it's imputed to us. His righteousness is placed on our account. We've talked of this over the last couple of weeks, this positional righteousness that we have in Christ Jesus. Because of his suffering, death, and resurrection, on our behalf, we are clothed in his righteousness. We stand before God faultless, blameless, declared righteous. His righteousness is credited to my account. It's credited to your account. It's ours in him. The moment we're born again, that becomes ours. And it's ours forever. It's ours eternal. Jude, there's only one chapter in the book of Jude, verses 24 and 25, it says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. Aren't you so glad it doesn't say, now, keep from stumbling? No, it says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now, and forever. Amen. I mean, that's, a, that's an amen, right? We are able to stand before him faultless and blameless because, again, he keeps us that way. And I say this, and I emphasize this many times, and some of you say, man, Pastor Brett, you say that all the time. <laughs> well, it's because so many of us continue to try to impress God. Continually. Even though we hear it all the time, when the rubber meets the road, when Monday rolls around, we somehow try to impress God so that he will accept me, so that he will bless me, so that he will, he will make his face shine on me as I go throughout the week. And guys, it's not going to be based on anything that we've done or that we can do. It's based on the fact that we stand righteous before him, clothed in the righteousness of God, the righteousness of Christ, ours. Christ is our righteousness. <clears throat> We are in him. We are accepted because of him. In spite of us, because of him. 
But it doesn't stop there. It starts there. This isn't the last word in our Christian experience. Guys, this is the first word in our Christian experience. Because it goes on, it doesn't just say that he became to us wisdom from God and righteousness. Notice, and sanctification. <coughs> sanctification, that we've talked of that word. It does mean consecration, it means purification, it means dedication, it means being set apart for God, separated from the, the simple, secular, worldly things, and set apart for the sacred, holy God things. He has a special use for us. But we need to understand that this sanctification, this living it out, this walking it out, is the holiness of Jesus becoming mine, becoming yours. His holiness being exhibited in our lives. Once again, it is not because Jesus gave us this example and said, all right, now you do it. Notice, in Christ, he became to us sanctification. Not an example. No, him. He is our sanctification. His life, his holy qualities implemented in me. And the Bible tells us that this is a mystery. This isn't something that is easily grasped. But, but I, I, I like the illustration of this because I, I, I loved golf. I haven't played golf in a long time, but I used to play all the time. My family, I, on Mondays, it was a given I'm playing golf. And at least once other during the week, I would go out and play golf. And I always wanted to get better at golf. Has any, anybody just tried golf ever once? Yeah. And realize how hard golf is? I mean, golf is a very difficult sport. Anybody can go out and play golf. <laughs> right? Anybody can play. But very, very few play well. <laughs> and so Scotty Scheffler is the number one golfer in the world and has been for a couple of years now number one golfer in the world I can watch all of the Scotty Scheffler videos until I can't I can't watch another one I can read every article I can watch him play I can try to imitate everything that he does and I will never 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 golf like Scotty Scheffler I can tell you that right now. There is no way that I will ever be able to do that. No matter how much I try, no matter how much I practice, I will, I will get frustrated and quit. The only way that I would be able to golf like Scotty Scheffler is if Scotty Scheffler got inside of me and took complete control of me. I'm not helping at all, and he does it. And guys, that's the secret to understanding how holiness happens in us. It's not us reading this and say, okay, I got to do that. No, it's Jesus, only you can do that. And yet, now I surrender and submit to that. Earlier in Colossians chapter 1, Paul writes this in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. The mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but now has been manifested to all his saints, to whom God will to make known what is the riches of the glory, this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's the mystery. Christ in us. Not, and, and here, this, this is an important distinction. It is not drawing from Jesus the power to be holy. It is drawing from him his very holiness exhibited in me. Now you might say, well, what's the difference? There's a big difference. Again, it's not that I'm grabbing a hold of something and I'm now trying to, to, to power it out. No, it is me submitting to that. So here it comes, guys. Here's the question. Am I willing to let God make sanctification as real to me, in me, as it is in his word? Am I willing to do that? It's been years as we have been in our in our sin, that we have formed bad habits leading to failure and sin, right? Are we willing to let God, through the holiness of Christ in me, form good habits in my life? His purpose for me. I 
remember reading a book a while ago, and the title was entitled Victorious Christian Living. And I just, I, I grab a hold of that statement because so many of us are, are living as Christians. But how many of us are living victoriously? Day to day, moment by moment, victorious Christian living. Is it easy? No. It's not easy at all. We see in the Old Testament, as we've studied through this, we've talked of this as, we, as we've gone through this um, in the Saturday morning Bible study and, and throughout. You know, the promised land is a picture not of heaven. The promised land is a picture of this idea, victorious Christian living. The promised land, guys, in heaven there will be no battles. There will be no more wars. There will be no more failure. But as we go through this life in this promised land, guys, there are going to be battles. There will continually be ground to be taken. There will be lessons to be learned as the children of Israel learned lessons as they went through. And what is the lesson that they learned over and over because they forgot over and over and had to learn it again over and over is that when they let God do it, they win. When they start doing things in their own will and in their own power and in their own wisdom and all of that, they lose. And you would think it would only take once, maybe twice, but no, over and over. And we, we all can kind of chuckle at that when we see that, but how many of us are doing the same thing over and over, day after day, week after week? We need to recognize that we are set apart for God's will and his service, and we must yield to him for whatever he wants us to do. Guys, there are no shortcuts in this at all. It's a slow process. I know it's a slow process. Not because I'm looking at you. Because I have to live with me. But can I challenge you as I challenge myself right now? It is a slow process, but it doesn't need to be as slow as it is most of the time. If we understand the secret here, and we embrace it, and we own it, we... We talk of this often where the, the, the answer so often comes when we're talking about holiness, when we're talking about how it is that this, this manifests itself in our lives and, and we're challenging each other. What is the first thing that, 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 that is our, our flesh response to that? Well, yeah, but nobody's perfect, right? Can I tell you that though that might be a reality, we use that as an excuse. And we can't. Because Christ is in us, the hope of glory. Yes, I may fail, but he never does. And the more times that we just learn to lean on him. Guys, that's why fellowship is so important as believers. That's why Bible study, that's why just getting together and praying together and just, just having that accountability with one another is so important. On a, on a separate note, just real quickly, it's not enough to know the truth. Knowledge is not the, the litmus test for salvation. Satan knows a whole lot more of Scripture than you do. No offense, but he does. He knows way more than I do. He knows it forward and backward. He's had a lot of time to, 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 to study it, to try to find the loopholes, to try to find the things that aren't there, but he's been looking. That's not the litmus test. The real test is submission to Christ in you. The real test is growth into his likeness. Paul tells us to examine ourselves, to see that we're in the faith. We should be able to say, and we should be able to show, and we should be able to know that, yeah, I'm not where I need to be, but I sure am not where I used to be. And I'm, and I'm, I'm learning more and more day to day to trust that, that Christ is in me, and he has a better plan for me, and I'm going to yield to that, and I'm going to surrender to that. That we learn to see with his eyes, to he hear with his ears, to love with his heart, to think with his mind. Because you're in him, and he's in you. 
calls on us to abide in him and he in us. It's still a struggle. Our enemy is very real. I am not, not going to downplay that at all. Our enemy is very real. He hates you and he hates me. And he is crafty. And he is relentless. And he's really good at what he does. Let's give him credit. He's really good at it. But 1 John 4.4, 4, You are from God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And it is not a little bit greater. It is infinitely greater. We were talking about this on Thursday night, and it just dawned on me. I don't know where this popped into my head from, but just the illustration. You ever see Indiana Jones? Remember the first movie, Indiana Jones? I didn't see the last one. Don't plan on it. But the first one, when when he's when he's walking down the street, and the guy the guy jumps out, and he does has this machete, and he's going da 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 da, da and he and he's, and he's he reaches for his whip, and it's not there, and he's ah, and he just pulls out his gun, boom! Right? Remember remember seeing that? Why do we? It's like. Here's the enemy, and he wants to mess with us, and he wants to fight with us, and he's got a knife. And we say, well, i got to keep it fair. i got to fight with him with a knife. No, you don't. You have a gun. You have, you have infinitely more power. You have more than a gun. You have a nuke. <laughs> and, and we're going to try to fight with him on his terms? Guys, it's not a fair fight. It's not so, it doesn't have to be. Why do we give in to that all of the time, guys? Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. So here's my challenge. Here's the thought. Are you living like one that Christ has set free from the shameful shackles of sin, or are you still allowing sin to place shackles back on you? Romans chapter 6. We don't have a time to do a study of it. I encourage you to read it today, tomorrow, this week. Read it a couple of times. But Romans chapter 6 is so powerful in that it talks about the fact that we are no longer who we were. We are, we have, who it speaks of this idea of, of baptism that signifies and shows that we have been baptized into Christ Jesus. We were baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. That old man has, is dead and buried and a new creation has risen. And it goes on to talk about this it says, even so consider yourselves to be dead to sin but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Do not go on presenting your members, the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you. God said all the way back to, to Cain, he said, sin is crouching at the door, but you must master it. God wouldn't tell him to do that if he didn't have the power to do it. And we have the power, infinitely greater power now, because Christ is in us, right? We have no longer sin master over us. We must master it by the grace of God in us. And then verse 19, he says, For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, resulting in further lawlessness, again, those habits going down that way, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, resulting in sanctification. <laughs> That's what we do. We present ourselves. Lord, it's no longer me. It's no longer I who live, but it's you who live in me. Presenting ourselves to that. And guys, that's, that's the key to this. Again, it's hard. Again, it's challenging. Again, we have to continually battle this. But can I tell you, there's a day coming when, again, as we've talked about, that we will be free from the very presence of sin. And that is where we come to our last word in verse 30. By his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and notice also and redemption. Redemption, speaking of that glorious day when we find ourselves in the very presence of God. When we are fully redeemed, when our redemption is fully realized. So verses that speak to this, Romans 8, 23. And not only this, but we, but also we ourselves having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. The full, when we fully realize this redemption, this, this, this purchase out of sin and death, and the full redemption of ourselves. We re recognize and realize that fully. Ephesians 4.30 
do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Um, it's a sense in, in which there, that, that we're redeemed the moment we are born again. Yes. It is a done deal. It's not in the balance. It's not like, man, I hope this works out. No, it's done. But guys, there's still so much more to be done in us, right? Jesus said, it is finished. He didn't say, you are. He didn't say, I am. Not until we stand in his presence when that will take place. 1 John 3, 2, beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet appeared what we will be. We know that when he appears, we will be like him because we will see him just as he is. From God's perspective, it's done. Fully done. But from ours, it's not yet fully realized. But there is a day, praise God, when that will happen. We'll see this as we get to chapter 13 in 1 Corinthians, verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then will be in, then will I know fully, just as I have been fully known. There's a day when that will come, and it's ahead. And praise God for that. The redemption is a completion and fulfillment of all of God's purposes for us. We talked of that earlier. We mentioned that when we read Romans chapter 8. The, the being conformed into the image of his Son that's a process now, but guys, it's going to be in completion then. The culmination of all of the wisdom of God that would take a sinful man like me, a sinful person like you, and make us right and pure, and one day take us into the very presence of God in the very image and likeness of Jesus. What greater hope is there than that? How awesome. So the message of the cross, we've talked of this now the last couple of weeks, going all the way back to verse 18, the word of the cross, the message of the cross, the wisdom of God. The righteousness of God puts us back into right relationship with him, back into the center of his will for us. The sanctification of God makes us grow daily more and more into the image of our Lord Jesus. And the redemption of God will one day take us into his very presence. We close with verse 31, so that, so that, just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Guys, there's nothing to boast in. There's nothing for us to take pride in, in any of this. We just look to Jesus and we say, praise God, all glory to him. And can I say the last stronghold, the fall, and we talked of this last week too, is pride. I, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands because that would be, you know, our, our pride is what's keeping our hand down in the, in the, in the group. So um, that we all want to say, can't I take just a little credit? Can't, okay, God, you did the vast majority of it. I'll give you that. But I got to get a little credit for this, right? I mean, I, I kind of went above and beyond. No. No. Everything in our flesh, Anything that we could possibly boast in is what is keeping us from being everything that he is calling us to be, surrendered to him. Now, Jeremiah chapter 9 is what Paul is quoting here, and I'm going to read the full, the full context of verses 23 and 24. It says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth, for I delight in these things, declares the Lord. One of the most liberating truths that we can fully embrace is that everything comes from him. It is so freeing to finally just say, God, I get it. It's all you. It is not me. It takes all the pressure off. It is so liberating. He is the good shepherd. He is the provider. Sheep don't go walking around all proud of the fact that say, hey, look at me. Look at how much, look at how much I got to eat today. No, the only fact that, the fact that they got to eat at all today is because the shepherd took them to the food. They don't walk around all proud of the fact that, hey, no wolf is messing with me. In fact, the only reason a wolf isn't messing with him is because the shepherd is keeping the wolf away. And he's our good shepherd. We need to boast in him. Man, look at my shepherd. Man, look at my shepherd. Hey, you've got to know my shepherd. You're, 
I tell you what, you want to see? You got you got to come see. You got to meet my shepherd. He'll help you see. Guys, we embrace this truth and I pray that God would take the imperfectness of the of the messenger and the message and and take this truth and plant it in our hearts that it's his wisdom that is imparted to us. That it's his righteousness that is imputed to us. And that it is his holiness that is implemented through us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this amazing truth. We thank you for your word. And Lord, I do pray that you would take this truth and as we meditate on it by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would help each and every one of us to understand this but Lord to embrace this fully in our lives because as we spoke and as we've gone through this sanctification we understand it's a process and we understand that it's a that it's a slow and, and difficult process but Lord it doesn't need to be as slow and as difficult as we make it if we will simply learn the secret and embrace the secret and walk in the truth of this secret that you have revealed to us. This mystery, Lord, it's, it's a mystery, but it's, Lord, it's a mystery that you've revealed the answer to us. <laughs> so, Lord, we pray that you would take that truth and that you would mold us and shape us and transform us more and more into your image. That we would learn to call upon your wisdom, your righteousness, your holiness. Jesus name. Amen. 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 Let's let's stand. We'll close with one last song again together.